everyone. Morning, everybody. Welcome to this morning's live stream, uh, live from the Well Sheffield. It's wonderful to be with you. What a great weekend, weather-wise. I think it's due to be 26 Doesn't get any better, does it, in degrees. Sheffield? It's, yes, it's really exciting for us to enjoy summertime. So we bless your Sunday if you're listening live to just enjoy this wonderful summer day and may today may the next hour be part of setting you up for the day that you would walk out this day with God come on uh, this is going to be our second last service in this format we are still going to have live stream you're still going to be able to feel part of the well family going forward if by chance actually you're listening right now and you have joined us over this lockdown period you've become one of our listeners one of our viewers uh, we're really thrilled to have you with us uh, you may be in different parts of the country you've been letting us know that from London to Newcastle etc and just for you to realize that these 10 o'clock live streams will be coming to an end after next week we'll still have one more next week uh, that is because we are going to have a whole church gathering here in Sheffield on the 27th uh, of the month at Worlow Farm and there'll be no live stream on that day and then after that live stream will continue throughout the summer but at the time of seven o'clock so do know that you can be part of the family going forward but from seven o'clock on now today we are continuing uh, with our series on, on the Beatitudes and we've camped out for a few weeks on uh, the, the Beatitude uh, around relationship and justice as we consider our lives out of lockdown going forward. The words of Jesus are timeless. It's, it's wonderful in that way. And yet we're learning to interpret the scripture and to feed on it and to apply it and to take action, to actually live it. It's never theory for those who really want to follow Jesus. And later in the service, Nick's dad uh, will be speaking to us uh, and he has great wisdom to bring uh, in his late years and he's known for how he loves to passionately teach the word of God and he'll be speaking to us on the whole subject of justice but before that coming up we have a particular focus don't we Nick um Race well, that is what we're talking about. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yes. Yeah. Um, yeah. So uh, we do. We we do, Marcia. We do. Uh, so I mean, as you say, we've been talking about hungering and thirsting after righteousness. That's what I'll be talking about tonight at the 7 p.m. here live as well. Uh, and uh, we we thought this was an opportunity to revisit something of um, our conversations from uh, that began a year ago around racial justice and uh, understanding that we're one family. Uh, before God in this church and so uh, you know there's uh, Paul said that there's neither slave nor free black nor white uh, male nor female etc uh, uh, etc et Jew nor Greek uh, he, he said there's no distinctions when you're a member of the family of God mm -hmm. and uh, it's easy to say that but it's not so easy necessarily that to, to have lived that out uh, culture and history uh, make that harder sometimes don't they and so we wanted to revisit um, the conversation that we we wanted to begin publicly last this time last year after um, the sad death of, of George Floyd and the movement of Black Lives Matter which came to prominence uh, and so I sat down earlier this week with Delroy Hall Dr Delroy Hall who's uh, one of our guys here at church one of our, our church members and I just asked him for, for some of his perspective. Um, he's, uh, he's very experienced, he's very uh, knowledgeable in this field particularly as well. So let's hear what Delroy had to say and then we'll, we'll come back. And, but before we do that, I, want, I wanted to read actually from, um, from 1 Corinthians 12. So Paul uh, does say this. He says, it basically says, if one part of our body uh, suffers, then all of us suffer because we're, we're one body before, before Christ, in Christ. Uh, and, and so he says this, the body, the human body, human body, like my legs, human body has many parts um, and the parts make up one whole body. So it is, so it is with the body of Christ. Uh, some of us are Jews, some of us are Gentiles, some of us are slaves, some of us are free, but we all have been baptized into one body by one spirit and we all share one spirit. So we're one, we're one in God's eyes. And this makes for harmony among the members of the body so that all members care for each other. If one part suffers, all parts suffer with it. And if one part is honoured, all parts are glad. And, uh, you know, there was just this groundswell, wasn't there, for, for Christians as well last year, where we're thinking, hang on a minute, this means that some of our body are suffering. Um, we haven't even acknowledged it uh, properly, uh, carefully enough. 
that uh, members uh, of, of color within our church communities here and around the country and around the world were, were, were voicing that they were in pain, that they were suffering, um, that, that they, they didn't feel as equal as the Bible says, and we believe that, that we all are. And so we took time to talk about that. So I wanted to ask Delroy to help us one year on to continue to reflect on that because it's absolutely vital that as a church, as a church really community, at the well we get this and we, we don't just um, kind of acknowledge it and nod our heads. We live differently. And we listen. Isn't that a key thing, that we're listening to others? We don't think we already know it all. We live perfectly. We walk humbly with our God. Yeah. and with others as, as family. For me, that's true identity, that we live with who he is, who we are, but also who my brothers and sisters are. Yeah. So we'll, we'll listen to what Delroy had to say, and we'll see you in a few minutes. So we're here today. I'm going to chat with Delroy Hall, who's a, a really important member of our church. i have been around for... Three years, something like that? Yeah, October's about two, two years, I think. Yeah, two, three years, something yeah, like that, yeah. Which is yeah. great. Mm-hmm. Uh, and uh, I've asked uh, just to have a, just to kind of pick up on, we've had a, we had a conversation actually maybe la- last summer it was when we, mm-hmm. we did a Wise Lives episode. Um, and uh, there was a, a big swell across this nation, across the world, uh, with the sad death of, of George Floyd and mm-hmm. others in America. Sure. And there was a, an awareness that came of, of Black Lives Matter and, mm-hmm. and issues of racism and, and even issues of racism and, and it, within the church. And it's not that they weren't already there. Mm-hmm. It's sure. that there was, I think, a, a greater awareness for, for, for others sure. about some of that stuff. So you, you, we, we were just chatting, weren't we? And uh, you said um, you used to lead a a black majority church Mm. and then it was weird for you to come Mm. to to this church Mm. as a white majority church indeed um (laughs) i've never thought of this church that way (laughs) no no why would you yeah um uh yeah so it was very it was strange i'd heard about the well from my ministerial supervisor and i came and the first time i came and the second time i came i remember being in worship and in tears and um that is something that didn't happen often, but certainly when I sense the Holy Spirit, that's what happens to me. And I remember when it, one of the times it happened when I was pastoring in Leeds, and I remember we had a visitor, and she saw me in the pulpit, I was in tears, and she said to a friend, black men don't cry in Chapel Town. Well, actually, we do. Yeah. Um, so, um, yeah, it was strange, because I've been in all my life, you know, black majority church, been a member of, and then a pastor for 30 years, and then decided that it was time to kind of life to take a different direction. Mm. And came, this was about the third or fourth, came here for a couple of Sundays, liked it. And I think one of the things that I sense here, despite being a minority, I felt really at peace here. And that for me is really important. Mm. Um, and I kind of kept coming and, and the next thing I knew I was a member. I think I spoke about yeah. it. The next thing I knew my name was on the, on the list. So I've been here yeah. and um, obviously with COVID-19, it's kind of distorted things. I've been watching rather than I've been watching on site. Yes, so, so what, what can we... What are your observations about being a Christian, being a black Christian in your case, mm-hmm. but, but, and being in a, a, you know, a church like ours where a year on from Black Lives Matter and, 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 and taking the knee in sports games and just all this awareness, mm-hmm. has, has what's changed or what's not changed? Um, yeah, it's, quite, it's a good question, actually. I think, obviously, there is an awareness, and I think, certainly for me, seeing that committees and executive boards are taking on more people... Mm. And I'm thinking, mm, okay, um, is this... Now, I guess part of it, it's a reaction to what's taken place. But I do struggle with the word inclusion, partly stimulated by something that a guy called John Swinton wrote, pastoral theologian. He said that inclusion is very superficial and political, but belonging is more important. So I know people of colour, black people, who have been... Um, co-opted onto committees and boards still feel very alienated uh-huh. and then they don't kind of hang around much and then they kind of go yeah. and, and I think this, it's this whole thing around inclusion is very I always I'm very careful about things that are in vogue that you know could people we kind of get on the bandwagon but belonging for me is more important it's more challenging more demanding and one of the things about you know people might say well, well what do you mean well actually if you're if somebody's taken on what well, they are taken on as an equal Mm. Their points and comments are validated as much as yours, and that helps the peop- for people to kind of feel belong. Mm. 
uh, right. in a particular group. And it's a two-way thing as well. It's not absolutely. that we make you belong. It's that you want yeah, to, and you yeah, choose to engage and, yeah. and so on. And, and I think um, one of the, the, the observations from, from UK Christians and um, 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 people of colour in this nation in the last year, it ha, it ha, people have said, um, you know, it's not, it's not enough that you believe in equality mm. uh, and uh, you know I, I'm pretty clear from the Bible that there's no Paul says there's neither slave nor or free there's Jew nor Gentile we're mm. all one in Christ Jesus sure. so that's my starting point theologically sure, sure. we are all one there isn't there is there's no difference in God's eyes mm-hmm. uh, between us yeah. um, and yet it's not enough to just kind of hold well we're all equal actually people are saying guys you need to stand up for us we need to see that you you care yeah. and see that you're fighting on our behalf yeah. because this is this hurts. It may not hurt you, but it hurts us. Mm. Yeah. I think for me then, it goes from belief to behaviour. So um, I remember a psy- um, psychiatrist, um, I can't remember his name, something Bell, and he has this argument, I think it's a very strong argument. He says both white people and black people, they agree on equality, but yeah. the starting position is different. Uh-huh. White folk will believe it in terms of an idea but a black person's position, starting position is one of experience. Right. So quite, there's a Jamaican, there's a, sort of, there's a Caribbean phrase, he who feels it knows it. So if you kind of feel pain and difficulty and discriminated against, somebody might say, oh, you know, that's not right, because it's an idea. But if you're feeling the pain of it, in a sense, it, it's kind of visceral and it's real. Mm, yeah. Um, so for me, it's about behaviour. And I'll, I'll see things change when somebody will stand up and say, no, this is wrong. I saw what you did. It wasn't right. Um, that's not acceptable. Yeah. So it's, it's about behaviour. Yeah. Totally. And I actually think, um, I really love the idea of Jesus teaching about turning the other cheek. I've said to folks, he really doesn't give us the option to walk away. So turning the other cheek is not kind of being a doormat, but yeah. my understanding from Walter Wink would be that how do you confront violence without being violent? So actually Jesus doesn't give us the opportunity to walk away and pray about it. How are we going to confront this atrocity? Yeah. So I think for me it's about behaviour. Yeah, yeah, really good. Yeah. And, and I've, uh, again, we were really moved actually as a church staff team. We tried to listen carefully. We invited mm-hmm. members of our congregation, uh, particularly some of the young adults sure, sure. Who, are, who are black to come and talk about it, hear their experiences. Mm-hmm. It was really moving. And there's, the, as you say, there's a, an experience, there's a pain for sometimes uh, that's not something that I was aware of particularly. Mm-hmm. Uh, and that really was really important that we gave time. And, and, and um, over the last year, I've tried to read, read the book. You know, mm-hmm. I've sure. been, Marjorie and I have been on um, Zoom calls with um, church leaders mm-hmm. who've, and they've expressed pain, mm-hmm and anger mm, really sure. yeah, yeah. and they're like guys we're the church this shouldn't be happening in mm, the church sure. you know come on guys uh and and don't just as you say don't just talk about it mm. for my for me it's don't just read about it and understand it what are you going to do about mm-hmm. it yeah um so i wonder how a year on from from that groundswell yeah. what would you how would you encourage us as a church to kind of grapple with this uh, well, certainly keep doing what you're doing. I think the conversation has to be had. Yeah. There is a danger for many people not to start the conversation because they don't want to get it wrong. Well, get right. it wrong and let's sort it. Okay. Um, That's con- very gracious of you. I, I, I just think, for me, let's start the conversation. Yeah. If you get it wrong, you get it wrong, and we can take two, take yeah. three. Take- yeah. And what's, what's difficult today is not difficult in a month's time, but we need to start the conversation. and. Really and, you know, one of the things I said, you know, before we had this kind of uh, being recorded, that, you know, we all come with biases. Yeah. To say that we haven't got biases, I just, I, w- I won't believe you. Um, I really don't believe you. But actually, what do we do with them? How do we manage our biases towards disabled people before, between tall people or people that are not so slim and all the rest of it? So how do we, how do we manage all that? Yeah. Okay. Don't know. But we need to talk about it. Well, I think, certainly for me, I'm, I'm, I'm uh, somebody who... So if I'm doing any counselling training, I say to folks, look, um, as we go through this, as we go through this course or this module, there may be times you, you might be feeling quite uncomfortable. That uncomfortableness is a message trying to get your attention to look at it. So if something happens and you feel quite uncomfortable, 
it's, it's, it's stirred you, it's disturbed you, I'd be saying to you, at, at a physiological level, yes, there's a reaction. But actually, what is your body, your mind, trying to get you to look at? Yeah. And I'm, I'm just a big journaler. I've been journaling for over 21 years now. So, um, you know, if you start writing about, you know, why do I feel this way? The whole process of writing for me helps kind of slows everything down and helps me to understand what's kind of taking place. So one of the things we can do, something happens, something at work, we should have said something and we didn't or we heard a comment and it disturbed you, I'd say, get home, get your pen and paper out, start writing about it. Why didn't you move? Uh, you know, why didn't you take, an, um, why didn't you take action? Yeah. What's going on? Yeah. You'll have another opportunity to do something about it. Really good. And, yeah. and, and we bring the Lord into that, don't we? Yeah, Just absolutely. say, Holy Spirit, talk to me, inspire me. Yeah, absolutely. Let me hear from you. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, and I found, a, I found a book, there was a book that we we've both come across this year called um, We Need to Talk About Race mm -hmm. by Ben Lindsay, yeah. uh, who, um, who's black uh, in a Pentecostal church background, uh, I think. Sons of God, I understand. Sons of God, yeah, yeah. cool. Yeah. And he just very honestly said, this is, guys, this is what it's like to be in a minority in the UK mm -hmm. church. Uh, and again, it's, it, as you say, it's about, it's about, it starts with awareness. And, uh, and um, perhaps this year we can say to each other, um, I, I am willing to be challenged mm -hmm. um, in my behavior and, and my assumptions and so on. Uh, you know, we, we're talking about that Jesus said, uh, blessed are those who hunger and thirst after righteousness. Sure. Uh, uh, but hunger and thirsting is not a passive thing. It, it's a, you go after it. And, yeah, and so the question perhaps for some of us is, are we willing to engage again mm -hmm. with the, the issue of, of race, racism, uh, equality, uh, just belonging, being sure. one family. Mm -hmm. uh, Paul says, we, we, you belo in, in, in Romans 12, Verse about verse five, he mm -hmm. says, "We're one body and we belong to one another." Sure. That's really, really powerful. Mm -hmm. yeah, uh, the is. question is, how much under under our skin, I suppose, yeah. are we going to let that go? Yeah, yeah, that's it, that. That's um, interesting. I think um, mm, I think getting involved it means the first thing you have to do is kind of get out of your comfort zone. Um, so, in the kind of uh, the cycle, or the I can't remember the term, but there's a, a model that I use. Um, but we become an anti-racist. And the first, the centre point is kind of your comfort zone. Right. The next zone then is the fear zone. Uh, then after the fear zone is the learning zone. After learning is growth, then after the growth is transformational. But you start, you need to start asking difficult questions of yourself. Yeah. But what can happen in some work situations, if you see something that's been unjust and you make a comment about it, dependent on, on who's on the board or the management, could actually jeopardise future careers. Yeah. So then you may be saying to yourself, do you know what, I've got wife and kids and I've got a career to think about. So you might decide then to keep stum about it. So I think it takes a level of courage and boldness. All of us start off, you know, the comfort zone and then we start asking questions that takes us out of the comfort zone. And then whilst we're in the kind of fear zone for a while, then we start asking questions, further questions. Um, and yeah, we deliberately ask questions of ourselves. So from, from fear, from comfort to fear, to learning, to growth and transformational. Brilliant. And that's not a 10 week course. No, it's a life. Yeah, it's a lifelong it? yeah, life thing. In the power of the spirit mm. and in community. Yeah, absolutely. And in the Christian community, which is why it's so great to, that you've been willing to just share yeah, briefly with us. Thank sure. you. Okay. Uh, and uh, you told me as well that uh, there's a possibility that you may have a book coming out. You want to, what's the working title? Yeah, the working title at the minute is Redemption Song. Anybody knows Black M Bob Marley sang a song called Redemption Song. Yeah. Uh, Redemption Song, Illuminations on Black British Pastoral Theology and Culture. So it's a, it's, um, a combination of writings I've done over the last 10 years. My friend said to me, do you realise you've got stuff for a book? And mm. I thought, well... Well, really? And a uh, long story, it's in the introduction that somebody helped me kind of put it together. And it's just stuff that I've written about uh, race, um, counselling, psychology, discrimination, pastoral theology, but from a kind of black British perspective, obviously with a kind of theological slant. Awesome. Yeah. I so. look forward to it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Delroy, thank you so much. You're we welcome. bless you. Thanks for coming in. You're welcome. We'll see you soon. Indeed. All right. Thank you. Thank Thanks you. Thank you. Well, thank you so much, Delroy. We, we really appreciate yeah, just your do. wisdom and your grace uh, and sharing your heart with us. I know it's not always an easy thing to do to go out on camera in front of lots of other people and, 
and uh, to be honest and vulnerable about how things are. So guys, uh, this is what we're thinking about today. We're digging in. Uh, Jesus said, you're blessed when you hunger and thirst after righteousness. And that doesn't just mean personally being kind of okay. It means social justice as well. The righteousness and the justice of God actually um, happening in real life uh, in our society around us. And, and the issue of, of race is, is one of those big issues that we need to be grappling with and be willing to go there and to acknowledge our own um, prejudices and so on, like, he, like uh, Delroy said to us. Uh, but also to say, well, we are the body of Christ. Actually, we're empowered. We do live in the spirit. Mm -hmm. We are one one body, many parts. And so we're perhaps the best placed organization in the world to make a difference. Uh, the church is the most diverse membership organization in the world. Uh, absolutely. Uh, yeah, and so why true. not uh, us be the answer and us uh, begin to set the tone for our nation uh, and, and begin to disciple our neighborhoods into what it is to live in it with unity in diversity, which is exactly that picture that, that Jesus paints of the church. And I, I love the theme for this morning, the fullness of the scripture. And Derek is going to take us through that. Hunger and thirst means you go for it. You know, you're desperate. I find real challenge in that. It doesn't mean just you agree with it or you're doing okay with it, you know, and, and um, you show justice or you like the idea of the theory of it. It means that someone would look at your life and say, she passionately is, is making a difference to the world around her, stands for things. There's a real challenge for all of us in that, that idea of the hunger and the thirst. And I think when it comes to this issue, like Nick spoke recently to us as a team, you know, it's not just that everybody would feel equal in our midst, it's that we would actually be anti-racist. Yeah, we we would show the love of God. There is a difference in that. Between being neutral and being, well, I agree with this, and actually being anti uh, racist and campaigning and standing and making a stand and, and speaking out positively in favour of these values that we hold really dear. Simply because, not because it, it's political or it's in vogue or anything else, but because it's the Father's heart. Yeah. And yeah. we represent Him and we love Him and the whole of the rest of this service will be about representing the Father's heart. And, and friends, uh, however you view things, this is really important if we're followers of Jesus, that we represent Him and we're open to be carrying soft hearts. That's what I want to have, a soft heart to, to see all the time how I could carry Him more. And so join me in just praying this prayer this morning, even in this worship time as we worship, that we would be being changed to be Christ-like. We come into the presence of God and we are changed. So Jesus, we worship mm -hmm. you today. Uh, yeah. Maybe you might want to stand. The, the guys are going to lead us in a, in a joyful song right now. Uh, and it might be helpful if you stand and engage and we lift our arms up to the heavens and we worship with our bodies yeah. and our souls. But Jesus, we offer ourselves to you in praise and worship right now. Amen. Amen. feel you left enough the weight of the world and I can feel you left enough the weight of the world and I can feel you left enough the weight of the world you are my joy you are my joy you are my joy you are my joy you are my joy, you are my joy. You are my joy, you are my joy. And I can feel you lifting off the weight of the world. And I can feel you lifting off. You are my joy. 
you are my joy, 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 you are my joy. just going to keep playing uh, wherever you are this morning watching this let's just take a moment to remember that he is our joy the peace the hope we have in in him let's just take a minute let's put our hands wherever we are sitting sitting standing in the garden wherever we're at say Jesus you are my joy thank you that you bring joy I just invite that into my situation this morning I was going to sing that chorus and go back into that bridge again. Let's take this time if you want to just to focus on him and just give thanks this morning, this beautiful morning. Because in you is all my hope and my peace. In you is all my hope and my peace. In you is all my hope and my peace in you is all my hope and my peace in you is all my hope and my peace in you is all my hope and my peace in you is all my hope and my peace in you is all my You are my joy, you are my joy. 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 Spirit, come move on us. Come and rest on us. Come and rest on us. As the Spirit was moving over the waters. Spirit, come move on us. Come and rest on us. Come and rest on us and come down. Spirit, when you move, you make my heart pound. When you're in the room. You're here and I know you are moving I'm here and I know you are with me Calm down Spirit, when you move, you make my heart pound When you're in the room You're here and I know you are moving I'm here and I know you will fill me Spirit was 
Stars moving over the water, Spirit, come move on us. Come rest on us. Come rest on us. As the Spirit was moving over the waters, Spirit, come move on us. Come rest on us. Come rest on us and come down. Spirit, when you move, you make my heart pound. When you're in the room, you're here and I know you are moving. You're here and I know you will fill me. Come down, Spirit, when you move, you make my heart pound. When you're in the room, you're here and I know you are moving. I'm here and I know you will fill me up. You'll fill us up, Lord. Again, open up the gates that haven't come in. Come rest on us, come rest on us, and fire and wind. Would you do it again? Open up the gates that haven't come in. Come rest on us, come rest on us, and come down. Spirit, when you move, you make my heart pound. When you're in the room, I hear it. You're here and I know you will fill me Calm down, spirit, when you move You make my heart pound When you're in the room You're here and I know you are moving I'm here and I know you will fill me Calm down, spirit Here and I know you are moving. I'm here and I know you will fill me. Calm down, spirit. When you move, you make my heart pound. When you're in the room, you're here and I know you are moving. I'm here and I know you will fill me
thank you, Lord, that we can come to you in praise this morning. Let's pray that wherever you are, you've just been able to connect with God this morning. There's something happening in this place. It's great. This, you might see me flapping during worship. We've had people coming to the door. And um, it's great. People are hungry for God. And I think we just need to be open to what God's doing and open to what he's doing where we live, where we work, and everything that's going on in our lives and stuff. So, Lord God, thank you that we can come to you and worship this morning. And as we worship, as the sound goes out from the room, as it goes beyond where we are right now, I pray that people in our localities hear the hope we have in Jesus this morning and carry that through this day and through this week. Amen. Thank you, Ben. Thank you, uh, Jen and Latifa, for leading us right yeah. behind us. Thank you so much. Uh, we continue to be in the presence of God, don't we, wherever you are right now. And uh, we're going to allow the Holy Spirit to, to encourage us, to bring us into worship to him, and also to be challenged and changed as we hear uh, the word of God uh, unpack for us in a few minutes' time. Amen. Just a couple of things of family news to bring you up to speed with before uh, we hear my dad uh, today mm -hmm. speak uh, by the powers of technology. Uh, so uh, first thing is, is that we are, um, this is our penultimate live stream on a Sunday morning. Thank you very much. Um, which would have made last week the what? Oh, come on. Come on. The anti-penultimate. <laughs> got to be able to say it once in a while, once a year. Got to use that word. Um, so uh, we will be returning to two services on site here at the Well Sheffield from July onwards. Um, we're, we'll wait and see what Boris has to say and the government in terms of their arrangements and so on, but that's what we're going to do. Uh, mm. And so you will still be able to catch us on live stream. It will be from the 7 p.m. gathering here on site. So we'll also we'll be live here for the service as we have been uh, for the last few months. We'll also be live streaming the 7 p.m. And 10 a.m. on site here at the Well Sheffield will return to an all-age uh, time. Um, and so we're hoping that uh, you, you'll come. Uh, and uh, it, particularly, it's going to be brilliant for the children and youth to be able to come back into that sense of family and worship again. Yeah. Okay. Uh, and next week, look out for our graduation of Deeper, our School of mm -hmm. Ministry. So they're going to be taking over somewhat our live stream. And uh, we're going to be hearing testimonies of lives changed, of hearts transformed through Deeper this year. I always love that. Every year. It's so, so good, the stories. And I'm sure this year will be no different. It's amazing how Deeper has kept operating um, well done to Naomi and the team. We're very grateful all through this uh, difficult year. Yep. Um, but the kingdom of God doesn't stop um, moving and changing hearts and lives. And so we'll be celebrating that. Look forward to that next week. We totally do. Uh, and, uh, and the week after the 27th of June, we've been flagging this for a long time. It's our church big day out at Worlow Farm. If, uh, on the 27th of on June. On the 27th of June, yes. If, if, you're in, if you have a ticket, uh, that's fantastic. We have, at this time, closed uh, tickets uh, for that event because of, um, you know, the, the, we just need to be careful in terms of uh, space and we're waiting to see what the government have to say this week. Uh, there's a possibility that if you have a ticket and you're coming, we may need to be in touch with you because we may need to go, instead of meeting twice for worship, we may need to work, meet three times um, and just spread people out a little bit across the day uh, so that we have enough, literally enough space for social distancing and so on in, in, this, in the barn that we have. Uh, but we will wait and see on that one. We'll be watching the news the same as you this week. Uh, but, but the event will go ahead. Absolutely, we'll be there. And we will be there worshipping. The sun will shine in Jesus' name. <laughs> and you can join us no matter what gathering you're at for the games, the picnicking, yeah. the animals. Come for lunch. Yeah, we'll be seeing people all throughout the day. So how fantastic. There are now many, many people booked on. We've reached yeah. our cutoff point. So look forward to seeing the church family on that day. Also, coming up, we have baptisms on the 11th of July. If you have not been baptized, we and you think that you have now committed your life to Jesus, we would really encourage you to take that step, that public declaration. Uh, do contact us at the office, info at wellsheffield.com, or speak to one of the leaders if you would like to be baptized. What a wonderful opportunity in this summertime and as the church gathers back again to yeah. make this statement for great. Jesus, the 11th of July. Okay, that's, uh, that's our news, folks. Uh, keep an eye on wellsheffield.com for, for more and for updates or on our Facebook uh, pages. So uh, let's spend some time now listening to what uh, the Lord has to say to us through the Bible. And we're going to think particularly about hungering and thirsting after righteousness. And so we're going to switch over to Studio B. And we're <laughs> going to hear from uh, my dad, Derek, who's going to bring the word of God to us today. 
Well, we've arrived at a beatitude this morning that is immensely challenging, but also very encouraging. God blesses those who hunger and thirst for justice, for they will be satisfied, Matthew 5, verse 6. Now, if you prefer the NIV, uh, you won't have found the word justice in there. You'll have found the word righteousness. And it's all about the translation of a Greek word, dikaiosune, which in the uh, New Living Translation comes out as justice. It's actually one of those words with layers of meaning. It can mean righteousness in the sense of what is good and right. It can mean godly living, right living. But it can also mean justice. And that really is righteousness out there in the public and the political arena out there in society. So that's what I'm looking at this morning particularly. It's about championing the, the rights of the afflicted. Jesus is actually saying nothing new here. Although it sounds like a revolutionary statement, as most of these statements are in the Beatitudes, he's actually totally in line with the Old Testament. Let me read you from Micah chapter 6, verse 8. O people, the Lord has told you what is good, and this is what he requires of you, to do what is right, in other words, to act justly, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with your God. And time after time in the Old Testament, the requirement for justice is emphasised. Here's Leviticus 9.15. Do not twist justice in legal matters by favouring the poor or being partial to the rich and powerful. Always judge people fairly. So the fact is that justice is a top priority for God. It isn't a sideshow, it's not an add-on or a, a, an afterthought in any way. It's fundamental to God's will. And the reason for that is it's fundamental to God's character. Justice is fundamental to God's character. And it's therefore fundamental to the kingdom of God. And Jesus stresses that and he reinforces it. So basically I've got two questions today. What should justice look like and where do we come in? Well, let's start with the first of those. What should justice look like? And I'm not concerned really about the law courts. Uh, the British legal system may not be perfect, but it's about as good as you get. I'm really looking at justice in society, social justice, looking for fairness for all. Let's start then with economic justice. And you'll be well aware that the COVID crisis has exposed the, the huge inequalities in our society between those who have and the, those who have not. And it's very often been the poorer sections of society that have suffered most. For example, children in poorer families, um, they've hardly had connection with the internet. Their schooling has suffered, their online schooling, because they've maybe had... Um, a mobile phone or just one tablet between three kids. Think about food banks. There was a time when the food bank was a fairly rare thing. It was for emergencies. Now it's really become part of the, the system. Here's a quote from a guy, an ironic quote from a guy from Hartlepool, where the, the Tory party won a recent by-election. He said this, I voted Tory because now we've got nine food banks and we had none under Labour. <laughs> Think about that. And then there's the campaign for school meals during the holidays, uh, led by Marcus Rashford, MBE, keen that children should not miss out on their decent meal each day that they get at school just because it's holiday time. So we've got these huge inequalities in our society and they are getting wider. So here's the question, if the kingdom of God were reflected in our society, how different would all this need to be? Think next about racial justice. And racial and ethnic tensions really come from um, the fact we have a fallen human nature. The us and them mentality comes out of the fact that we've lost sight of how God has created us to be. And out of that comes deep evil, 
not just between people of different colour, but even between um, different groupings within an ethnicity. For example, the, the genocide in Rwanda. And what racial prejudice does is to dehumanise other people, people who don't look or sound like you or me. And once that dehumanising has gone on, it opens up the way to discrimination, to oppression, and then not far behind it, very often comes violence. Discrimination has been a, a simmering grievance for decades in our society. You get unfair employment practices, you get insults, put-downs, hatred, the kind of stuff that's been publicised on Facebook recently. And then, of course, it gets to the headlines when you get something like the, the Black Lives Matter protest and footballers taking the knee. And then protests, in their turn, can turn to violence. An alienated minority might well begin to protest violently rather than simply putting their case. And you can look back uh, to the riots that were, there were in Brixton and Tottenham. Now, those were two places where our family lived. And um, I'm glad to say we weren't actually there when the riots took place. We just left in each case. But simmering resentments can bubble up and cause tremendous mayhem. Back in the 1970s, Sally and I worked with the Baptist Missionary Society in Congo. And we were there as part of a tiny racial minority. I remember getting off the plane in Kinshasa when we first landed and every face was black and I should have expected that but of course I'd not been there. But we were part of a privileged minority, we really were and we'd been welcomed because of the work that we were doing as missionaries. We then returned to live in the UK and to live in Brixton where the population would have been 50-50 between black and white. And very often the black population there made to feel like second-class citizens. And recently there's been all the publicity about the scandal of the way the Windrush generation have been treated. We were part of a Baptist church in Brixton, Kenyan Baptist church, which was looking in those days, we're talking about back in the 70s here, to bring black people onto leadership and to give them a real voice in the church. And that was quite groundbreaking stuff. And I remember the, the pastor who was very forward looking saying, the future is black. And he was right. Now surely with all this going on, followers of Jesus have got to be in the front line of addressing this, calling out prejudice and taking the words of Jesus seriously when he says, God blesses those who hunger and thirst for justice. And not just saying it, but doing something about it. Something like 20 years ago, the Baptist Union appointed a racial justice coordinator, Wally Roberts, uh, who's still there, still in post and doing a great job. And his remit has now been widened to tackle other aspects of injustice in our society. If you want to get a flavour for what it might feel like to be a black person in this country, there's a new publication that um, the Baptist Union have produced. It's called I Can't Breathe. I noticed a, a copy or two in the foyer as I came in. Get hold of it. It's an eye-opener and it's very challenging. On a slightly lighter note, we witnessed um, quite a number of racial tensions when we lived in New Zealand. We came back about seven years ago. And we came across two conflicting worldviews. And this is often where <laughs> the difficulties arise. The Maori and the whites, who were called a Pākehā by, uh, by Maori, were still trying to resolve issues that had grown up in the 1800s, would you believe? In those days when things were pretty lawless, a lot of land grabs had taken place. And today, many Maori are uh, in relatively poor situations, a lot of poverty. Now, over the last uh, decade or two, considerable reparations have taken place. And Maori tribes have been given large amounts of land, property and cash 
in an attempt really to make up for what injustices were done to them in the 1800s. And part of the problem was uh, a misunderstanding really, a different understanding of a crucial treaty. The Treaty of Waitangi, 1840, would you believe? Which was technically between the Maori chiefs and Queen Victoria. Gives you a flavour where this goes back to. What had happened was that Pākehā, whites, had uh, purchased large amounts of land, very often at ridiculously low prices. But the Maori, from whom they bought this land, really had no concept of selling their tribal lands. Any more than Her Majesty the Queen would dream of, of raffling off the, the succession to the throne. It was unthinkable. The Maori saw what they were doing as a kind of leaseback arrangement where um, whites would be allowed to use the land, but it would still be Maori land. And now, of course, they're wanting their lands back again. And that's where the nub of the problem comes in New Zealand. The truth is we can very easily misunderstand other cultures, sometimes inadvertently, sometimes deliberately for profit. One Maori comedian, and I stress here, a Maori guy, commented like this. He said, Maori are no longer going to be allowed to be organ donors in case they decide they want the organs back again. A nice example of Maori humour. So back to my big question, if the kingdom of God were reflected in our society, how different would all this need to be? The other level of injustice I want to look at is international injustice. And to be honest, justice is not a high priority in many, many countries in the world. You might say that injustice is almost an international way of life. A couple of examples from recent times about um, COVAX, the organisation supposedly rolling out the COVID-19 vaccine to poorer countries. And there's been a distinctly lukewarm response from the haves towards the have-nots. And basically says, you know, we don't think you matter all that much. Who is my neighbour? Somebody asked Jesus. And he told the story of the good Samaritan, who was the guy, the unlikely guy as it happened, who came to the beaten up man's aid. Think about our UK foreign aid budget. Now, this has been reduced below pledged levels recently on the grounds that we can no longer afford it. But the results are that education and rights for women are compromised in many countries. Lots of water, sanitation projects will be pulled. Lots of healthcare projects will be stalled or really abandoned. And frankly, there'll be many deaths in many countries as a result of our pulling back and saying, sorry, we haven't got the extra cash for you. Now contrast that with the, the justice that fuels, for example, the Baptist Missionary Society work with IAM in Afghanistan. Uh, Nick's brother's been involved in this for years. It's all about justice so that women are no longer deprived of safe birthing practices, for girls no longer deprived of education, Families no longer wrecked by blindness that is easily curable or by mental illness not properly addressed. And for villages that are struggling without fresh water or sanitation. That work is all about justice. And so is the whole fair trade movement, guaranteeing a, a fair price, a just price for raw materials like coffee and, and chocolate and um, bananas and the rest of it and also adding a premium so that the village of the producers can really build some some infrastructure into their village like a school like a health center and we can all support that fair trade is in every supermarket and we can support it and say i'm on the side of justice here when you look around the world, there are many regimes not in the least interested in justice. They're interested in their own self-preservation. Even their own citizens are expendable. You think about what China has done in Hong Kong with its own citizens. 
You think about the protests that have been crushed in Belarus and in Myanmar. You think about Putin's invasion of Crimea. Iran's detention of Nazarin Zaghari Radcliffe, who's only one of many illegally, unfairly detained. And think also the persecution of Christians in countries like Afghanistan, Pakistan, the Arab states, China, and many, many others. Injustice, a way of life. And then there's the really big one, climate change. It's so unjust that many of the countries who are suffering most are doing the least in the way of polluting. Great chunks of Bangladesh, for example, are threatened with flooding, and so are some of the Pacific islands at this moment. And then in sub-Saharan Africa, you've got the, the desert spreading and spreading as the climate changes. It's going to lead, already leading, to food shortages and mass migrations. And our indifference and our failure now is really sabotaging, sabotaging the future of the generations to come. It's an act of willful injustice, of stunning proportions. It's in unjust, injustice towards the future. And no wonder the younger generations are getting really steamed up about this, and rightly. So my question, if the kingdom of God were reflected in our society, how different would all this need to be? Well, it's glaringly obvious that the world as we know it is a long way from Dikaios Sune, what I defined as righteousness, right living, and justice, public righteousness. And the words of Jesus are totally countercultural. They, they fit the kingdom of God, not the kingdoms of this world. God blesses those who hunger and thirst for justice, for they will be satisfied. But, you know, it's not enough to describe injustice or even lament it. Jesus went much stronger than that. Jesus doesn't say God blesses those who approve of justice and complain about injustice. He says God blesses those who hunger and thirst for justice. And that brings me to my second question. Where do we fit in? What's our part in all this? And I can be a little more brief on this question, really, because the basic answer is simple. Just come back to our beatitude. God blesses those who hunger and thirst for justice, for they will be satisfied. Those who hunger and thirst. I mean, hunger and thirst are basic. We perish without food and drink. And I think Jesus chose his words really deliberately. He was speaking in a society that knew what hunger and thirst really were. And he was stressing that this is basic. And the point is this, that justice cannot be just a mild hobby, uh, just a mild interest. It's not an optional extra. It's not an add-on. No, it isn't secondary. We can't leave the cause of justice to those who have a particular bee in their bonnet. It's something for all of us who claim to follow the Lord Jesus. It's core kingdom stuff. God blesses those who hunger and thirst for justice. Jesus is talking about an instinctive passion here. If you like, an obsession with justice. The fact is that our just God requires justice. And we are his instruments for justice. It's fundamental in the work of the kingdom. So, if justice is one of God's top priorities, where does it come on your list? We have a just God. If we didn't, the whole universe would be chaos. We hold on to the justice of God at all times, but it has to work out in practice in the work of his kingdom. If justice is top of God's priorities, where does it come on your list? Are you interested? <laughs> That's a start. But you know, interested doesn't hack it. Do you hunger and thirst for justice? Is it a passion? 
is it an all-consuming passion as it was for Jesus? Let me rephrase that, as it is for Jesus. He is passionate about justice. And we who claim to follow him need to be alongside him sharing that passion and doing something about it. Maybe the Holy Spirit has ignited a passion in you as we've been thinking about things today. So my question is very simple. Okay, what are you going to do about it? Just to conclude, we, we shouldn't lose sight of the promise in our beatitude. Let me read it once again. God blesses those who hunger and thirst for justice, for they will be satisfied. That's the promise. They will be satisfied. So how does that stack up? Uh, it does not mean that every campaign is going to be successful, though many campaigns are. Um, like you know, going way back in history, the abolition of slavery in the British Empire and so on, and education and rights for women in many countries. But when Jesus says they will be satisfied, I think he's, he's looking long term here because God is just. He's the righteous judge of all the earth. And ultimately, justice will be done even if we don't live to see it. Justice is basic to the kingdom of God. Put it this way, as the kingdom comes, then justice comes. Though that may be in heaven and not on earth. I want to close off with a, a very moving passage in, in Revelation chapter 6. And here John has a vision of the many, many Christian martyrs crying out for justice. And the Lamb, the Lord Jesus, is taking authority here. And the martyrs see the kingdom beginning to triumph and they're crying out for long, long-awaited justice. So Revelation 6 from verse 9. When the Lamb broke the fifth seal, I saw under the altar the souls of all who had been martyred for the word of God and for being faithful in their testimony. They shouted to the Lord and said, O oh, sovereign Lord, holy and true, how long before you judge the people who belong to this world and avenge our blood for what they have done to us? Then a white robe was given to each of them. And they were told to rest a little longer until the full number of their brothers and sisters, their fellow servants of Jesus, who were to be martyred, had joined them. It's moving to reflect on how many have died simply for their Christian faith. And it was, it's reckoned that during the 20th century there were more Christian martyrs than in the previous 19 centuries put together. So here we have a picture of these martyrs died because they loved the word of God, and they loved the Lord Jesus, but alive in heaven and awaiting the moment of their vindication when the justice of God would triumph for eternity and they will be satisfied. Now we can and we must leave that moment to the Lord Jesus himself, to the Lamb. It will come in God's perfect time. God's justice will be established for eternity. We need to be involved in establishing God's justice here and now. Remember I said, as the kingdom comes, then God's justice comes. So for you and me, in the 21st century in the UK, our mandate is to hunger and thirst for justice, pursuing justice with energy and with passion. Because we are children of the living God who is totally just. He's the judge of the whole earth. And he will bless us as we join him in the cause of justice that is so close to his heart. May God bless you. As we go into this last song, we're going to sing a song which is going to be new to some people called Broken Pieces. Um, it's written by Far and Wide, which are a collective of worshippers here in Sheffield, um, students and things. And the, the chorus, the pre-chorus, and this is mold us, refine us, Lord, we pray. I think that's really important just to be open this morning, just to let him work within us. So you can follow along with the words, and if you know it, sing along. Just let the words speak to you this morning.
The city was made with souls restored brick by brick. You're building your home. The city is made with souls restored brick by brick. You're building your home and mold us, refine us, Lord, we pray. Restore us, define us by your name. And mold us, refine us, Lord, we Restore us, define us by your name. You take our broken pieces and you call us home. We are your masterpiece, children made whole. You take our broken pieces and you call us home. We are your masterpiece, children made whole. You're our refuge, renewing hope, step by step, drawing us close. You're our refuge, renewing hope, step by step, you're drawing us close. Refine us, Lord, we pray. Restore us, define us by your name. And mold us, refine us, Lord, we broken pieces and you call us home we are your masterpiece children made whole you take our broken pieces and you call us home we are your masterpiece children made whole Blow through this city, bring it to life. Come, Holy Spirit, you we trust and you we hope. Blow through this city, bring it to life. Come, Holy Spirit, you we trust and you we hope. Come, Holy Spirit, come, Holy Spirit, come, Holy Spirit. You we trust, you we hope. Blow through this city, bring it to life. Come, Holy Spirit, you we trust, you we so we've come to the end of our time together just echoing that prayer holy spirit uh, mold us shape us soften our hearts clear our heads open our eyes to be more like you i bless you to be more like jesus on this day what a prayer let's just say yes to that to become more like him that's a prayer that we can't fail with it's the most beautiful way to actually take stock on a Sunday or start a day with may we become more like you Jesus maybe we'll see you throughout the day we have our family gatherings we have um, our service tonight if not we bless you for a wonderful Sunday wherever you are get some sunshine and enjoy enjoy. yes we'll see you soon bless you guys